talk from Howard Chu from Sinus Corporation, one of our sponsors. By the way, also Core Scientific is one of our sponsors, and I want to thank them very much, very much for that. Uh, and in the meantime, it looks like Howard is bringing a fiddle up. This makes me super happy. Um, can we get his title slide up so I can read it out loud? Can I? Great. Uh, so everybody, Howard Chu from Sinus Corporation on ASIC resistant proof of work, fact or fantasy. So when you do this, it's going to be that button forward, that one back. Okay. So. Good morning. I had to make that quick because this, this talk may be uh, running along. So. All right. Which way am I pointing this? All right. That helps. It always helps to turn it on. So hello, I'm Howard Chu. Um, a founder of uh, Simus Corporation. We actually celebrated our 20th anniversary just uh, last week. Um, and I've been writing software for something like 40 years now. I've uh, been part of open source from the beginning of open source. I've worked on all the GNU utilities, the compiler, debugger, linker, tech info, all that stuff. Um, I not only have software on pretty much every computer on Earth, I also have software that's run in orbit and has never crashed. A few things uh, that I've done uh, noteworthy over time. I have a fondness for fast software. In the realm of uh, security, I've also done a lot of work with cryptography over time, secure authentication, and various uh, security systems. Okay, so to the meat of the matter, when we're talking about ASIC resistance, you know, what, what does that even mean? Why does it matter? And then you know, how do we get there? So just to set the backdrop for all of this, you know, where, where is all of this discussion coming from? You know, Monero, which is based on the CryptoNote protocol, uh, designed somewhere around 2013, 2014. Uh, you can see just, if you read through the white paper, that it's, it's a strong reaction to observing flaws in the design of Bitcoin, right? Uh, you can see that um, you know, the Bitcoin notion of pseudonymity just, just isn't adequate to protect its users. Uh, the, the fact that the Bitcoin software has hard-coded constants in it that that uh, have severe impact on its scalability, you know, was very obvious already. And uh, while the design of Bitcoin was intended to be decentralized, you know, the, the reality was that there was heavy centralization going on in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you know, as early as 2013, 2014. So I uh, dug up these graphs of just an example of the hash rate distribution of miners in 2013, and you can see um, the potential for 51% attacks is really high, right? It, it would take one or two pools to collude and, and your network is, is toast. And then you can also see the, the evolution of mining technology, right? You can see where in the very beginning of the, the, the very first year of its life, it was all just PCs, CPUs running, and then suddenly, 
people discovered, hey, GPUs are really good at SHA-2. And so the GPU era begins and things really take off. And then uh, hobbyist ASIC designers get into the game. And then towards the end, it's all the professional, very large commercial scale ASIC designers. And, and the very first ASIC, um, you know, by today's standards, it's already just a very modest improvement, but that was already a 50 times improvement in efficiency. And, you know, today, you know, nobody dreams of mining Bitcoin on their PC anymore, right? Because the ASIC advantage is on the order of millions, okay? Millions of times more efficient than a CPU. Um, and the, the experience that we see from observing Bitcoin is that, hey, look at this, you know, when you start depending on specialized hardware, uh, you find that it automatically promotes centralization, which is something that, you know, we're trying to fight against the entire time because, you know, centralized power means uh, you have trust problems. And the, uh, actually, Christy mentioned this before as well, you know, the ASIC builders tend to uh, use their own ships to mine for themselves. Uh, rather than selling them to the general public. Or maybe they will sell them to the public, but only after the chips have become obsolete. Yeah. Okay. So how come these ASICs can be so effective? And in this particular context, I'm still talking about the Bitcoin SHA-2 ASICs, all right? And, and the reasons are you know, fairly simple. First of all, uh, the hardware itself is very simple. It's, it's uh, designed to do only a single thing, so it's fixed function hardware. It only has to do one thing, and the thing that it does is fairly trivial, all right? The SHA-2 algorithm was actually designed to be easy to compute, right? So the, the amount of work that you're trying to accomplish there is very simple. And the algorithm itself is brain dead easy. It runs in a straight line. You know, there's no decision points in it. It just, you start, at, at one side, you come out the other side, and you know that's it. And so, if you look at the hardware for SHA-2, you find that it's got about a dozen components. It's really simple stuff, right? Um, I don't expect you to read the circuit diagram on the right, but you know, trust me, it's it's just a couple of add operators and a couple of registers, and these things are trivial in uh, integrated circuits. All right, so you find there's, you know, there's no decision making, there's really no branching, and 100% of the hardware in that circuit is devoted to crunching your answer, right? There's, there's nothing wasted on memory or timing or anything else. And when you've got a circuit this simple, it's easy to put thousands of instances on it on a single chip. And so that's, you know, that's the environment that we have today with Bitcoin mining. All right, so uh, again, the CryptoNote protocol was designed in reaction to this. So there were, um, but it wasn't the only one that tried to address this, right? If you look at um, Ethereum, you know, Fhash also is designed to be ASIC resistant. And they both took uh, a similar philosophical approach, the, the memory heart approach. Right. And it turns out that uh, the CryptoNote guys were a little conservative in their estimates. You know, um, CryptoNote worked pretty well for about three or four years. And I would say time and technology caught up to it. And the resistance that it offered was you know, defeated. Ethereum, Ethereum is still in pretty good shape with Fhash, right? Um, but I would say, you know, its days are numbered as well. So there have been other attempts as well. Um, you know, you see the, uh, the so-called multi-hash algorithms, and you, you find that these actually offer no ASIC resistance at all, because all they've done is take a bunch of different hash algorithms, and each one of those hash algorithms is still very simple. It's still on the scale of complexity as SHA-2-256, still has no decision points inside. And when you have these, you can treat them as little individual components, string them together any way you like, and an ASIC can process all of that 
very, very efficiently. So really what we're coming down to now is you know, dynamic algorithms which don't have a static flow of execution. Right? And um, there have actually been other ones you know, besides random X, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Funny enough, the very first one that I could find discussed was in the context of Ethereum. It was, the, it was an, an idea that they tried out before they settled on ethhash. And um, it, it has some of, the, uh, some of the characteristics that we have in random X. But if you look at um, what they developed there, it was very, I would say, unfinished. You know, they, they tried it as a prototype and they never really fully developed the idea. And then, uh, you know, late, sorry, early last year in about March, I uh, floated the idea of random.js um, and we worked on it for like six months, six or eight months before um, we found there were, you know, just some flaws in it that we couldn't fix. You know, there were weaknesses in the, in the approach. Another one that people probably have heard about is ProgPal, which Christie's team actually developed. Uh, it's focused on uh, the GPU approach. And um, in, in that respect, it does very well at uh, leveraging mass parallelism that you get out of a GPU. Uh, I would say that the random code that it generates is, is I still consider it fairly simple. Kryptonite R, which is currently running on the Monero network. Um, the, the reason Kryptonite R exists is because um, we weren't done yet developing RandomX. And so some of the ideas that we had already arrived at in RandomX were kind of lifted out of there and inserted into Kryptonite just so we had something as a stopgap. So, you know, some people have questioned or criticized our decision to focus on CPUs. You know, they say we are abandoning GPU miners. But, um, you know, you have to consider, you know, the, the global environment, uh, GPUs are really not that big a part of the picture. You know, there's, uh, there's far more CPUs deployed in the world. There's far more CPUs being bought every year. Right. And then, especially if you look at uh, smartphones, which are the fastest growing element of consumer computing, you know, there are 2.2 billion smart users, smartphone users in the world already, and they buy 1.5 billion new units every year. Okay, so there's more of them, and they upgrade more. Okay, so uh, just if you look at the PC upgrade cycle, most people don't buy a new computer more often than once every two or three years. Whereas the majority of smartphone users are probably on the latest and greatest tech all the time. And so this is something that really factors into, you know, the, the kind of technology we're developing, which has kind of heavy demands on a CPU. And so th the fact that there are more capable new smartphones works in our favor. Okay, so RandomX itself, uh, we're talking about randomly generated machine language programs for a custom virtual machine that we designed ourselves. And uh, the idea here is any random eight byte sequence is always a valid instruction. Okay, this was one of the problems we had in RandomJS, which is that uh, you know, you had to generate a random program that followed the legal syntax of the JavaScript language. So once you impose these uh, syntax rules on it, it becomes much more complicated to randomly generate a program that will execute. So now we're talking about a machine language where there are no syntax rules. Any random number you can generate will be a valid instruction. Uh, I call this uh, moderate complexity because um, you know, it, if you look at 
the random X virtual machine compared to you know, a real Intel or AMD CPU, our instruction set is still very small, right? But uh, it does most of what we need to do. And the mix of instructions that we use in the generated programs is modeled after the types of operations that you see in real life user programs. So just an idea of comparing uh, features of different approaches. You know, the, the first couple approaches, I would say, have zero ASIC resistance whatsoever. Then the next couple that came after that, they all used memory hardness as their only defense. And uh, now we've got these dynamic algorithms that try and use both uh, random code as well as other operations um, in random JS and in random X, we also use floating point math, which a lot of other algorithms have avoided. And you know, avoided for good reasons, because it's easy to get into floating point math and come up with uh, results that differ due to uh, rounding errors or different rounding uh, policies. So it's a tricky thing to be able to do floating point math in a proof of work algorithm where you need everybody to get the exact same answer. But I think we've, you know, handled that. And so the idea here, I mean, and the reason that we take this approach is that, um, you know, we're trying to fully leverage what CPUs are good at. And what CPUs are good at is running a broad variety of code, you know, and this is something that uh, if you try to build an ASIC to do the same thing, you're going to wind up building a CPU. Right? And again, we're focusing on CPUs simply because they are more accessible, also because CPU instruction sets tend to all look about the same. They all have the same set of integer math operations. They all have branch instructions, whatever. And so it's easy for us to define a subset that will run well on any CPU you can imagine. You know, so we can run this on ARM, we can run this on Intel and AMD, we can run this on PowerPC or whatever else you can uh, throw at it. Uh, in contrast, you know, uh, GPUs tend to have very proprietary instruction sets and, and there's not complete overlap between their functionality. You know, so uh, you know, like the AMD instruction set uh, doesn't even have um, one of the multiplies that that we use, so it's like, okay, uh, to, to target GPUs would just be a lot harder. You know, the, there's, the common subset would be much more limited. And, you know, again, we have the basic realization that the work has to be dynamic, right? If we just have a fixed set of operations, then that can easily be hardwired into a chip. And that's the thing that we don't want. Oops. Now, you think about, you know, wh what is a proof of work algorithm? And uh, at the end of the day, it's just a delay loop, all right? And uh, the goal of it is to consume time and to consume energy. Uh, and it's to be as inefficient at doing this as possible. And th this, you know, this was mentally jarring for me because I've spent a career building efficient software. <laughs> and you know, tuning compilers and all of this to to get the most work out of a system for the least amount of energy, right? But the interesting thing is, after you've spent all your time thinking about that, you learn fairly intimately what operations are expensive and what operations are cheap, right? So this does allow us to have a special perspective on how to write the most inefficient algorithm possible. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And the other thing is, you know, this, there's a common theme that I've run into is that uh, privacy and decentralization are diametrically the opposite of efficiency. You know, if, uh, when you have efficient systems, they all tend to be centralized, you know, and centralization actually improves the efficiency of most of these systems. And it's true not just in the proof of work, but if you look at network communication, you know, how do you, um, sorry, how do you secure uh, communication across the network. And, you know, we've talked about privacy a lot over this weekend. Uh, I think the privacy and secrecy 
have been thrown around interchangeably, and, and there's a strong difference here. You know, privacy is only a subset of secrecy. If you have an encrypted communication channel between two endpoints, like a TLS session, what you've done there is you've kept the contents of that communication channel private, but the fact that you had that communication channel is not private. People know that you communicated, okay? So you have a private conversation, but it's not a secret conversation. And for you to have um, privacy by itself doesn't cost too much. You know, an AES encrypted channel is fairly cheap, especially because we have hardware accelerated AES. But if you want to make something secret so that nobody knows that you've been doing it, then your cost in efficiency goes up quite a bit. All right? The way to make a communication channel secret tends to be you have to throw a lot of noise out there so that you can hide your communication under the noise. Right? And that means you have to generate a lot more volume of traffic to hide the actual message that you want to send. So um, again, when you have efficiency, it's kind of opposed to privacy and secrecy. And so what we're trying to do with proof of work is to be inefficient, decentralized, and uh, that still bugs my brain, but there we go. Okay, so with RandomX, we want an algorithm that is so inefficient, that uses so much power, that we're using as much as possible of a CPU, right? And uh, here we've got, you know, this is a block diagram from uh, an AMD Zen core. You can see at the top, there's this front end where we've got uh, the instruction cache, decoder, branch predictor, operation cache. So th this is the front end. Um, then we've got in the middle layer, you know, integer operation units, floating point operation units, and then at the bottom layer, we've got uh, memory interfaces and data caches. If you look at you know, what we've done in RandomX, it actually uses 100% of the components of the core, but it doesn't use everything else on the chip, right? The, the CPU chip has other interfaces. It's got PCI Express interfaces to all these other things. It's got uh, an administration bus for you know, uh, inter-chip communication, system management. Those are things that we can't really effectively utilize just because they're so device specific. You know, we, we can't account for them from one chip to another. But we can use all of the core and all of the memory interface. All right, so how does this all work? Well, we generate a random program, you know, we, we uh, thank you. Then we translate it into machine code, we execute the program and transform the output. So the most interesting part, the important part is step three. And we want the overhead from the other steps to be as close to zero as possible because they're not really contributing to the work. And as I mentioned before, you know, generating a random program is kind of a tricky part. Um, if you're using a high-level language, you, you have to uh, construct it according to very strict rules, otherwise the code doesn't execute. And uh, so the standard way to do this is you build an abstract syntax tree where every node of the tree is a statement in your, in your program. And the funny thing is, you go from this abstract syntax tree to program source code. And then you feed the source code into a compiler. And the compiler parses the source code and turns it into an abstract syntax tree, which you just had. So there's a lot of redundant work going in there. And so that worked against us as far as making an effective proof of work algorithm, right? And uh, if you are building an ASIC to process this, you can bypass all the redundant work. And if you can bypass that work, that means you've got an efficiency advantage. So this, this was something that killed the random JS idea. Right. So the, the best approach that we have now is you know, we uh, generate just random bytes. There is no syntax. There are no uh, construction rules. And then to translate this into native machine code that runs on a real CPU, um, 
You know, we, we didn't want to just target x86 because in today's world, you know, ARM and, the, and other CPU architectures are major players and we don't want to leave any of those out. So we use a virtual machine that we can actually translate well into any other real CPU architecture. And uh, in order to allow us to do this as quickly as possible, we need to use simple machine level instructions that uh, can be easily mapped onto real machine instructions. And you know, there just, there isn't time to develop an optimizing translator, you know, to analyze the code and rewrite it for a particular target because any time you spend on that is time you're not generating hashes. Okay, so the actual program has to use as many CPU components as possible, and you know we've we've analyzed a lot of CPU profiles to to get to this point where yes we are using every possible cache layer on the chip, we are using the instruction caches on the chip, we're fully utilizing all the integer math operations, we're fully utilizing floating point operations, we're beating the hell out of the memory controller, um, and so all of this factors in. The final result that we use is computed with uh, Blake2b, which is a cryptographic hash algorithm that was designed specifically to run well on CPUs. And then for even larger computations, we still use AES. And the reason this works well is because most modern CPUs now have hardware accelerated AES. If it wasn't for that, then that really wouldn't be an option. I think I'm going to have to race through the rest of this. But there, there is a problem where um, if you try to analyze the program, you know, it would be possible for you to design an implementation where you heavily optimize some of the operations and you avoid some of the other ones. And then you can scan a generated program and say, does this have my slow operations in it? If it does, I'm going to ignore this program. If it has my faster operations in it, I will execute it and get a faster hash result. So we've, we've had to address this problem by um, uh, chaining multiple programs together to force, uh, force any implementation to either do all or nothing. You either run the entire program or you skip it. One of the key constraints was that verification time had to be about the same as for kryptonite. Um, and because of that, this puts a strong upper bound on the complexity of the programs we can generate. The amount of memory we use is designed to kind of force you to use off-chip memory. So we're using over two gigabytes. Um, in practice, it's possible to build you know, chips with two gigs of memory on them today, but it's fairly expensive. Uh, so we anticipate that this is good enough for the next couple of years. But again, down the road, we'll probably increase these sizes. We have a light mode that doesn't require the two gigs of RAM, but um, so it only requires 256 megs of RAM. Uh, it runs about eight times slower than the, than the full mode. And if we were to reduce the memory, even further, it would, uh, the next step down would be 128 megs and it would be 3,700 times slower. So there's a time memory trade-off and we pick the sweet spot there. Okay, so the current status of the code, um, it's ready to run in Monero D right now for x86. We still need to implement it on ARM. Uh, GPU work is progressing. You know, we have support for NVIDIA, CUDA, um, there is kind of an open CL version for AMD GPUs. It, it, it's, it's not generic open CL. It still uses a lot of AMD specific assembler code. We've got four security audits. Uh, one of them was already completed. Uh, two of them are in progress right now. And actually the last one begins tomorrow. Here's some of the hash rates that we've observed so far. Um, you know, we're, we're looking to collect more benchmark data from anyone who's happy to run. And there we are.
this has been an absolutely fantastic presentation. Does anybody have any questions about RandomX or hardware mining and ASIC mining in general? I yes, back there. One thing I've heard somebody say online is that uh, when you're CPU mining only, the botnets are going to be a problem. Uh, you know, botnets have been around, and I don't think they're going to go away. But I do believe that, you know, the, the two gig memory requirement is going to make the presence of malware a lot more obvious, and it might make it annoying enough that more, you know, computer owners will take steps to address them. I have a question. Um, the, it seems like this is now 10 years into cryptocurrency, and the trend seems to be away from mining with consumer grade hardware. Like, if I know market cap's not a great judgment, but for you know the total value of the network, but there is no cryptocurrency in the top 10. I think Monero is kind of the first one that can still be mined with consumer grade hardware leaving Ethereum aside since they're moving towards proof of stake. Um, so I just was kind of curious at your like, high level view of if you think mining with consumer grade hardware is, is ever going to become something that anyone besides uh, geeks and nerds kind of will take part in. Uh, okay, interesting question. I think, you know, if you, if you looked at Christie's talk, I, I think the answer is yes, it's going to be fairly ubiquitous and probably something most people don't think about. You know, right now, us geeks and nerds, we're aware of it. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, it, it can just be ha running under the covers implicitly. Um, did the first audit reveal anything interesting in the code? The first audit. Um, there was uh, one issue that we patched, which they said, you know, we're using AES with a single round, and they thought, oh, this is not providing sufficient uh, randomization for thus and such use. And said, well, okay, you know, um, they they talked about not it not being secret enough or not irreversible enough, and uh, we have patched this to use four rounds, but uh, in the initial design, we really didn't care because it, it doesn't need to be secret because the input is already known, right? So, so yeah, there was there was an issue, and we patched it, but it's like, yeah, this this doesn't really matter that much. Uh, what is your professional opinion of uh, Harmony mining, like what Grin has with? hardware targeted algorithms and allocations for each hardware segment of the mining market? Uh, I think the example of Verge shows us that that's a really precarious path to take. And uh, it's so easy to get it wrong. Um, I'd, I'd just rather would not go there. You know, we're, we're trying to be extremely cautious here. That's why we're doing four security audits. You know. We're trying to do something that the overall structure is the same shape as what we've been doing with Kryptonite, so that you know, we don't disturb the ecosystem that much, and we know that the approach is one that's tried and true. Um, you know, if we get if we get something wrong here, I think it's going to be limited in damage. If we if we took this multi-algorithm approach, uh, you know, geez, we could be 51% attacked in a day. I mean or three times in a month, like happened to Verge. You know, uh, I just, I think that's more risk than we need to take. I think of GPUs as getting better faster than CPUs. If that's the trend, how will that play out and how it affects the application of RandomX? Uh, again, I look at the example of smartphones, right? You know, a year ago, I, I ported all of this uh, kryptonite mining code to my phone, and I found that the smartphone GPUs suck. All right, they they just don't have the memory uh, the memory capacities. They don't have the the bandwidth. Um, and I th again, because I believe this is going to be our most important target g going forward, I don't really consider GPU advancement to be a big part of the picture.
Um, any idea on the sort of limits of um, ASIC advantage on the random X? I mean, what are we talking about? Is it like two times, one times, 1.5, 110? You wouldn't hazard a guess? Uh, my guess is it's going to be under two to one. All right. Um, again, you know, if we're looking at the components of a CPU that we're using, you know, and the things that we're not using are basically interface buses, uh, you know, we're getting pretty good uh, utilization out of the CPU hardware. You know, there's not a lot of wasted chip area for what we're doing. So there isn't a lot of room for efficiency gains. So yeah, I would say it's well under two to, uh, two to one. We're gonna make this the last one. Uh, do you see cell phone mining farms becoming a thing or with the efficiency coming from the phones that you're considering? Uh, I, I don't think I would call them mining farms. But, you know, if, if, if everybody in the U.S. was mining while their phone was on the charger overnight, I mean, that would be a significant chunk of hash rate, right? So. All right. Well, everybody, I want to thank Howard again. Uh, everybody give him a hand.